In 2018, Netflix was involved in an arms race for streaming dominance with some of the largest, most powerful and wealthiest companies on the planet. To try and win the streaming war, they decided to one-up their competitors when chasing new television shows that they considered to be winners, the kind that could drive subscriber numbers for years to come. In one such case, they snatched away a project that turned into a complete nightmare. They thought they were getting a sci-fi epic that would spawn multiple spin-offs and years of repeat seasons that would drive subscriber numbers like their biggest show, Stranger Things. Instead, they got absolutely nothing, except for a man who took $11 million of their money to buy cars, clothes, and cryptocurrencies about dogs. This is the story about Conquest, the missing TV show that cost Netflix over $55 million, an ongoing legal battle, multiple jobs, and a whole lot of embarrassment. This all starts with one man. This is Carl Eric Rinch. Carl's body of work consists of a few things no one's ever really heard of, and then totally out of the blue, 47 Ronin a movie that should have been tolerable considering they had Keanu Reeves starring alongside some very notable Japanese actors, but was just, well, it was awful. How awful? Well, it's a 6.2 on IMDb, a 16% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, as well as a 48% audience score. It also costs somewhere around $200 million to create and only generated roughly $151 million which made it not only a critical flop, but also a financial one. This is the type of flop that kills your career instantly in Hollywood. So how does a filmmaker go from losing Universal tens of millions of dollars and making a wet fart of a movie to being handed $55 million in the keys to the kingdom from the largest streaming platform on the planet, Netflix? The easy, short, boring, and yet correct answer will immediately pop into your head if you've been a Netflix subscriber for the past five years, because Netflix quality control and general operation is absolutely shite. Look no further than their decision to cancel a large number of beloved TV shows each year once they get a few seasons deep, instead chasing new shows that almost nobody cares about. But in this case, the circumstances for the decision was actually quite interesting. Basically, the streaming war in 2018 made all the big players lose their minds. Streaming was exploding in growth, everyone knew it was going to be the new frontier of media, and companies were running double time uphill in the snow to piss in each other's morning coffee. If a show was being pitched around to Amazon, Hulu, Disney, Apple, NBC, Showtime, HBO, Netflix, or anybody else, you can bet that everyone else was trying to swoop in and grab what they thought could be the winners. Not just because they wanted the good shows, but because it was a double whammy. You could get the good show and you could deprive your competitors of that potential hit for their platform. After all, they realized most people will only subscribe to one or two of these at a time, meaning audience retention is the name of the game. It needs to be a constant revolving door of monthly shows that are pumped out to prevent cancellations and perhaps lose that subscriber on a long-term basis to the next platform who might be able to hold their attention for a little bit longer. So while this streaming war was going on, Carl Eric Rinch was running around town pitching a science fiction show which just so happened to be turning heads. You might at this point ask, why did no one bring up that Carl's entire portfolio wasn't exactly impressive, and you would be right to do so. In fact, maybe that's more than Netflix did. But just remember, streaming services right now didn't care. What you did before was considerably less relevant than what you could give them now. They were willing to take big risks for potential gems, especially if they could keep those out of competitors' hands. Essentially, there are billions of viewing hours out there to occupy, and they just couldn't fill them fast enough to grow subscriber counts. There just wasn't enough content, and so they'd take risks on content that they could find. Also, what some people don't know or maybe realize is that Carl didn't get to where he is now by being a total nobody. He was, by most accounts, an incredibly talented filmmaker, most known at this point for futuristic TV commercials for some major brands. He also held the people calling Eric the protege of Ridley Scott, a director with an incredible body of work, responsible for movies that are considered some of the greatest ever created. 
with that type of rubber stamp and connection, doors in Hollywood were always going to be open for him. In fact, he was even pushed forward to take over the prequel movie to Alien in place of Ridley Scott, which likely would have had more of a chance of success considering his body of work involved futuristic themes, but instead he was then attached to 47 Ronin. And of course we all know how that went, so he was thrust into this $200 million budget movie as his first experience in Hollywood, which was a big ask and he failed miserably. So his career in Hollywood was now over of course, but that wasn't the end. He went back to producing commercials, which were successful, and then self-funded a passion project, which he would later pitch to Amazon. It's about a genius life form that resembles humans, referred to as organic intelligent. They are supposed to help humans around the world, but later on they're discovered to be bad in some way and the humans turn against them. Not exactly the most unique idea, but as a pitch, something I'd be interested in as a sci-fi fan. The problem was though, it was nowhere near being ready to pitch, and at this point in his career, no one was going to fund Carl. The 47 Ronin situation had made him a complete toxic asset, not only due to the movie performance, but also his reputation on set as a director. There were rumours that he was difficult to work with and more than a little bit quirky. Instead, Carl hired staff from outside Hollywood circumventing union rules and began shooting what is reported in the NY Times as brutal conditions. In this article, they say that they were shooting in Kenya for over 24 hours straight that in Romania, an actress had to be rushed to hospital due to hypothermia after being bare-legged in the snow, as well as all the stories of Carl just being generally a nightmare to work with or for. So at this stage, it's after 47 Ronin, and clearly it had not humbled him in any way or made him reconsider his approach. Luckily though, Eric's production managed to take on investment from 30 West. This should have been a big W, but Eric missed deadlines repeatedly that came attached to that investment and almost lost his whole project when 30 West threatened to take possession from him. Luckily, during the filming of 47 Ronin years earlier, Eric and Keanu Reeves became friends and Keanu stepped in here like a hero to invest in the project as well as to come on board as a producer, which eased tensions between Eric and 30 West and allowed him to keep hold of the project. Now, with all the money and clout that he needed to succeed, they managed to push out a short six episode pitch with each being four to 10 minutes long and started to shop that around to big studios as a potential 120 minute first season. Somehow, some way, this horror story of a production didn't concern the big wigs in the streaming world who started falling over themselves and each other, trying to get in on the action and deny their competitor the misfortune. One after another, they were talking. Amazon, HBO, Hulu, Netflix, Apple, and even YouTube were all hooked. Originally, an eight-figure deal with Amazon was moving ahead quickly, but before it could be finalized, Netflix swooped in at the last minute and secured the project. But it cost them heavily, not just in terms of finances, but they also gave Carl complete and total control over the project, with little to no oversight. They even gave him final cut, a privilege that had only been given so far to a handful of their very trusted directors to this date. Not once though did Netflix stop to ask the other investors what they had experienced with giving Carl too much freedom, or even people that had worked with him on 47 Ronin, who now worked for Netflix as well on other productions. They were so willing to dump money into anything they could get their hands on that had any remote sign of promise that they ignored all the red flags completely. Right now for Carl though, he had everything he needed and could forge on ahead with total creative control over his own vision, a literal dream for any creative in any field. He was under no one's shadow, everything was his to do with as he pleased, and if he delivered on this, he would be back in the good graces of Hollywood, wiping away the stench of his first massive blunder with 47 Ronin. At this stage, Netflix signed the deal at $61.2 million and titled the show Conquest. Production continued, this time properly with unionized workers and a real budget. Very quickly though, people started to realize perhaps why Carl preferred using non-union workers. Within weeks, a union rep was sent to the set in Sao Paulo, Brazil due to reports and complaints of his behavior. Shouting, cursing, excessive irritation, just generally being unpleasant to work with. Luckily, that was resolved without much issue after Netflix had a quiet word with him privately. Unluckily, 
This was just the start, and this is where the story starts to go really downhill and get pretty crazy. During the shoot in Budapest, according to NY Times in a source familiar with the matter, Carl started telling people that his wife was planning to have him assassinated. Now, obviously, I can't say if she was or wasn't, but considering the other reports about his behavior, it seemed like Carl's mental state was rapidly deteriorating, and you're going to see that become more and more clear as this video continues. After filming Wrapped in Hungary, Carl's wife tried to get him into rehab due to his use of prescription ADHD medication, which is an amphetamine that can cause mania when used excessively. Which would of course explain why there were now accusations of him being violent toward people, including his wife, who he believed was trying to have him killed. It got so bad in fact that friends, family and crew members had to stage an intervention when they returned to Los Angeles, which sadly didn't work. Now this is where you're thinking, okay, so he's a bit of a mess at the moment, but he was still making the TV show, right? Well, yes and no. By 2020, Netflix had already reportedly spent $44.3 million on the show, and Carl was dragging his feet on everything. Netflix had zero idea about what he'd actually done up until this point. They'd not seen the footage, they were almost completely in the dark. Carl was also difficult to pin down for any of his responsibilities. He missed meetings, constantly changed his mind on finalizing the script, and was even apparently debating a massive change from the original 120 minute season to a script that was almost twice in length, something he couldn't possibly do with the remaining budget, and without a green light for a next season to a show no one had even seen yet. Luckily for Carl, and unluckily for Netflix, Carl had the power here. After all, Netflix were in for $44 million of sunk cost, and that's why when he told them production would collapse if they didn't send more immediately, they wired him $11 million, which was definitely going to go into producing the show. Right? Wrong. Almost immediately after those $11 million left Netflix's account and landed in the account designated for Conquest production, Carl wired $10.5 million of it to his personal brokerage account at Charles Schwab. And like one of those crazy people you read about on Wall Street Bet subreddit, he started to buy incredibly risky options contracts, which if you know nothing about stocks or what options are, I'll spare you the boring details, but it's basically a great way to make your account go to zero in a very short period of time, unless you're a very savvy investor. Most of the posts you see on Wall Street Bets and similar subreddits are people losing everything, with some crazy moonshots sprinkled in, and Carl thought he was going to be one of those. Essentially, these people treat options like gambling, and if you want to see sunk cost fallacy as well as degenerate gambling addiction, you don't have to go any further than these option traders on Reddit. As for Carl, well, he was now essentially gambling in his personal account with $10.5 million of Netflix's money, which, and let me be clear, this is speculation on my part entirely, seems like an odd first step on the ladder, from zero dollars of Netflix's money to 10.5 million immediately? Seems odd, and maybe there's some more there. Either way, Carl seemed to think he'd figured out some secret about the world, because he was betting against or for the impacts of COVID. He thought he could predict the market and placed millions of dollars of Netflix's money on that prediction. He bet that the S&P 500 would continue to fall rapidly, as well as that a biotech firm would rise quickly. Within a few weeks, he lost $5.9 million, or should I say Netflix lost $5.9 million and any shot of having this TV show created. But this is where it gets really rough. You see, according to divorce filings between Carl and his wife, Carl started to act even stranger as the pandemic progressed. There were texts shown in court where he claimed to be able to predict lightning strikes and volcanic eruptions. Clearly Carl had been on the slide for a while, and the pandemic really fucked him up bad. I know a lot of you will have also experienced this, but the pandemic really messed a lot of people up big time. Myself, I've got old friends, who I've known for over a decade, who were totally normal at the start, and then months later, they were posting about reptiles taking over the planet, and all these fringe crazed conspiracy theories participating in crazy Facebook groups. So during these divorce proceeds, Netflix were also reading the filings and very quickly realizing how fucked they were. 
the executive responsible for bringing Carl and the show to the table was made aware of everything. She took it to her bosses and shortly after parted ways with the company, as did other staff members directly above the project's acquisition. Netflix then tried to circumvent Carl entirely, going through his wife to try and get access to the footage in an effort to figure out if they could salvage anything from this disaster and perhaps make a TV show worth their already sunk $55 million. His wife of course declined, stating that she feared his quote, explosive reaction if she even brought it up to him. And this quote from the NY Times report needs no real explanation, but the new executive in charge of Carl and the project received an email from him that said he had found a way to quote, map the coronavirus signal emanating from within the earth. Yeah, so at this point Netflix got the police to involve a psychiatrist to determine if he was a threat to himself or others. They found out that he wasn't, at least for now. By March 21st, 2020, Miss Gerson, the Netflix executive mentioned above, informed Carl that Netflix was pulling out on the deal. They were finally cutting their losses. Essentially, Conquest would receive no additional funding, and if he were to try and sell the project to another studio, which he would be allowed to do, Netflix would need to be reimbursed the full 55 million that they had already pissed up the wall on the project. To this, Carl responded well, of course, claiming that they breached the contract, which is hilarious considering the court documents with his financial records from the divorce were now available, he knew Netflix had seen them, and they showed he'd taken their money and lost it gambling options, which I'm fairly sure wasn't in his side of the deliverables of the contract. He then of course took the remainder of the Netflix money and started to spend it gambling on cryptocurrency, the coin of choice. Dogecoin, of course. This man bought millions of dollars of a cryptocurrency about a dog that doesn't do anything, that was made completely as a joke. Seriously, Google it. The origin of this cryptocurrency was literally to make fun of cryptocurrency speculation. Pure irony. But Carl couldn't have written a script better than this, because you know the funniest thing about it all? He fucking won. That $4 million of dog coin turned into $27 million. This man couldn't make a movie or TV show, but he apparently could win the cryptocurrency lottery of being in the right place at the right time. He then did what anyone else would do, of course. He went out and started blowing the money as quickly as he could. I'm talking five Rolls Royces, Ferrari, a $400,000 watch, millions of dollars in clothes and furniture, he spent $8.7 million in a very short period of time. Then, during a deposition for the divorce, where they were trying to push to get some of this money, of course, Carl claimed he bought all those things with Netflix's money and that they were props for conquest. The TV show no one was funding anymore. According to the NY Times report, he then also claimed the total opposite in a confidential filing with Netflix. And that's the story so far. Netflix is currently in mandatory arbitration with Carl over their contractual dispute. He claims they broke the contract and owe him more money. They claim he broke the contract and didn't do what he said he would. As in, you know, make a TV show with 120 minutes of screen time and not buy dog coin with it. At this point, it's unlikely that Carl will win anything and even more unlikely that the TV show Conquest will ever exist. Much like Carl's career as a filmmaker. He had a perfect opportunity here to do something great, one that not many people get, with people who genuinely cared for him that had his back. Not only was he given a fantastic opportunity originally with 47 Ronin that he blew, but he was given a second chance which almost nobody in that industry is. Unfortunately, it seems like the problems that arose during the 47 Ronin production were not just one-offs or rumours, and that Carl had some real issues going on even then. Despite all of this, people who worked with him and knew him well claim he is, or was, a talented filmmaker. But in this circumstance, the Aristotle quote comes to mind. There is no great genius without a touch of madness. So I'll be looking forward to see what comes out of the Netflix arbitration. Until then, at least now you know where Netflix would rather have spent their $55 million instead of keeping the shows you loved on air. I mean, just think of how many of these great shows could have continued if Netflix didn't piss away tens of millions of dollars on nothing and just stuck with what people already loved. Feels bad, man.